<clears throat> both because I'm currently writing a book on the 20th century, and to tell you the truth, I kind of missed the 19th century, so it's been nice to... You miss it, you miss it. You work on so hard on these people, you, after a few years you miss them. Uh, and the other reason is uh, I, uh, I did generals in legal history, but I never actually really written, written legal history, but I always like being around legal historians, so I'm always enjoying being invited <coughs> to these conferences, so uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is um, I'm going to try to uh, show the history of the rise of economic indicators in both the North and the South, and then I'm going to try to link that very broadly uh, to the origins of the uh, Civil War. Um, like I said, this is my action meal, my last book. Uh, I don't, I'm not writing about the Civil Wars anymore, so uh, this is the book. Uh, and this is probably like kind of the middle of the book, the part that I'm going to talk about today. And um, in the first half of the book, one of the things that I do is I try to trace the way that Americans began to quantify progress, how they try to you know, measure what's a, what's a good life, what's a good society. And what I argue in the book is that one of the dominant ways, the dominant way actually, that Americans from around the 1820s or so, and that's when statistics, that's when the word statistics is invented, that's in general when statistics emerge as, as kind of like a, a, a science or, a, <clears throat> but also a rhetoric, a way of kind of like convincing people of your arguments. And I show in the book that from the, around the 1820s to 1850s, the dominant form of statistics that were used kind of measure progress were what were called moral statistics. Uh, that's what they were used, the term that's a French term, but then it was used in the United States. And in the sectional debates uh, over slavery between the North and the South, uh, we three from the 1820s to the 1850s, that these moral statistics are oftentimes used uh, by the North to kind of criticize slavery, and of course by the South uh, to defend it. So I gave two examples here. The book is, of course, filled with many more. Uh, the Liberty Almanac, which is an abolitionist newspaper from the North in 1849 tries to prove why the North is better than the South, and it does so by saying in Connecticut, one out of 568 persons was illiterate, in Virginia, one in every 12 and a half, Ohio alone had 51,000 scholars, more than to be found in 13 slave states. Uh, on the other hand, the South is also using these moral statistics in order to legitimize uh, slavery. <clears throat> Senator John Calhoun, which of course, one of the great leaders of the South, and really one of the first uh, Southern politicians who, unlike Jefferson before him, didn't see, you know, slavery is a necessary evil or something, but this is, you know, it's a generally good thing, and not just for whites, for African Americans as well, slavery is good. So he argues that, uh, quote, the, purpose is, the proportion of northern blacks who are deaf and dumb and blind idiots and sane paupers and in prison is one of six, while in the south it is one out of 154. So he's using these very categories of moral statistics to show that actually uh, life uh, for African Americans is better under slavery, and they have, of course, theories as to why this was. Blacks were incapable of living in a free society. They didn't have, you know, the, 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 <clears throat> the abilities to do so. Um, and so he's using these statistics. And this was a big, big controversy. I won't go into it now, but the 1840 census actually has a mistake in it. And it makes it look as if, basically, if you're a free black in the North, you might, there's a high chance you're going to go insane and end up in an insane asylum. Uh, so um, it, this is definitely something that is more than just a few quotes. This was a kind of big argument uh, in the 1840s and 1850s. Of course, it's ironic that today, when we think of mass incarceration, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, we should think that maybe these moral statistics uh, aren't so bad as measures of progress in society. Um, here are just some examples of the moral statistics that were used. Uh, alcohol consumption, life expectancy, mental health, as I mentioned, the number of scholars, deaf, dumb, blind, poverty, prostitution, that was a very big one. There were prostitution censuses that were collected, a lot of data on that. Uh, crime, incarceration rates, literacy, and, and libraries, which I thought is very interesting. Uh, as someone who, the book I wrote is basically a, a critique of GDP. Libraries is like the worst possible thing for people who measure society by GDP, because of course you can read all these books and gain all this knowledge, but there is no market transaction. You didn't buy the book, so it's not going to appear in the GDP statistics. Uh, and now let's get to the origins of our GDP-like statistics. Uh, Hinton Helper, uh, in the 1850s, as a turning point. Uh, so, this fine-looking uh, young man, Hinton Helper, he's from North Carolina. He writes a massive bestseller in 1857 called The Impending Crisis in the South and How to Meet It. Hinton Helper might be from the South, but he is a vaunt anti-slavery proponent. But his anti-slavery is very different. His critique of slavery is very different from the critiques that we've seen beforehand. It's not a moral critique. It's not a religious critique. It's not a critique about you know, arguing about the welfare of the blacks and things like that, but rather, Hinton Helper writes a whole book 
which is basically page after page of economic indicators that tries to show that actually slavery is bad because it's not productive. You can get more bang from your buck if uh, the slaves were free laborers who worked under a wage labor system. Uh, so here's one quote, which I think is very revealing of Helper's overall outlook. It has been no part of my purpose to cast unmerited criticism upon slaveholders or to display any special friendliness or sympathy for the blacks. I have considered my subject more particularly with reference to its economic aspects as regards the whites, not with reference, except in a very slight degree, to its humanitarian or religious aspects. Yankee wives have given the fictions of slavery, and here, of course, he is referring to uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the best-selling book that was the big critique of slavery, that was a very kind of moralizing critique of slavery. Men should give the facts. So we have this kind of masculine uh, uh, narrative of, you know, men have to give statistics and economic data and, uh, and, and the facts, and not none of this namby-pamby uh, moral stuff. Uh, but notice uh, the quote itself is also revealing that he's saying very openly, you know, I'm against slavery, but it's not because I care about black people. Uh, I have no interest, actually, in black people, or hardly any interest. I, I care about slavery because I care about economic growth, and uh, economic growth is, is going to be better uh, in a free society than in a slave one. Um, and I'm just going to give you one page. It's like 300 pages book. It's, 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 the fact that it was a bestseller is kind of amazing. It sold over 200,000 copies. By the way, if you got caught in this, with this book in the South, you were in big trouble. You could get hanged. Three people in Arkansas get hanged just for having it. Uh, but here's a classic page from the book. You'll see he takes the census data from 1850, and he uh, kind of looks at all the productive things that people, uh, that the productive uh, <clears throat> crops, uh, you know, multiplies it by the price, aggregates it, and lo and behold, we see that while the North, uh, the free states, generate $350 million dollars, of agricultural, agricultural produce, uh, the South only generates 306. Anyone notice a certain commodity that is missing from Hilton Helper's chart? Cotton, okay. <laughs> How convenient, okay, it's not gonna put. Uh, so yeah, you can get a sense of kind of, you know, his ways of also trying to fudge the numbers. Um, but he had a lot more examples. He talks about uh, slaughter, the value, he basically prices everything. You know, he prices slaughtered animals. There too, the North is more productive, they have more, uh, manufacturing, of course, bank capital, every kind of page of the book is to make an economic argument against slavery because slavery uh, is unproductive. Um, what's interesting is that when I began studying Helper, I quickly realized that Helper actually is responding to a narrative in the South that emerged before. Uh, Helper's book comes out in 1857, but already in the 1840s, there is a narrative that is very popular in the South. Uh, which is basically the argument goes, you know, slavery is incredibly productive and slavery is actually the source of most of the wealth in the United States. It's one of the reasons why America is becoming such a rich society. And in many ways, Hinton Helper's book should see as a reaction to that first uh, claim that the Southerners were making. So already we see that these debates, the shift from the moral statistics to the economic indicators is happening on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line, not just in the uh, North, but also in, in the South. And Elwood Fisher writes a famous pamphlet, I think this is 1847, where he shows, look at our per capita wealth. Uh, Maryland, $531 per capita versus Massachusetts, huh, only 406. Virginia, $758, New York, 260, Kentucky, and so forth. So, you know, the North, the Southern states, if you look at per capita wealth, they're much, doing much better than the, southern, than the northern states. Of course, small detail, uh, Fisher was counting uh, the African-American slaves as capital, but not as people. So, uh, and I can tell you that's a lot of capital. Uh, Piketty, uh, Thomas Piketty, the economist, uh, estimated that at the time of the Civil War, uh, slaves were worth more money than all the land in America combined. Um, on the other hand, you could say maybe Fisher was actually, you know, just counting uh, slaves as uh, any southerner would, as capital and not as human beings. I mean, that's what they were in many ways. Senator James Henry Hammond's Cotton is King, uh, famous speech, and here too he gives the same narrative, this is the same argument. Uh, this, there is not a nation on the face of the earth with any numerous population that can compete with us in produce per capita. He's talking about the South. Okay, produce per capita, that's basically, you know, essentially what GDP is, produce per capita. It amounts to $16.66 per head. Cotton has exceeded in value the exports of wheat and provisions to the extent of $21 million, barely cotton is king. And this cotton is king narrative is very, very popular and the North feels it really needs to respond uh, to these issues. And um, 
One of the reasons it feels it needs to respond to these issues is because uh, we've been mentioning a lot of times about economic elites. Uh, the economic elites in, in the North, especially uh, the ones who were uh, working, uh, kind of owned the, the cotton uh, factories in, in around Boston or, the, um, or made a lot of money from shipping cotton to England, it, uh, were actually pretty much, uh, were fairly, uh, I would say, uh, not supportive of slavery, but they definitely didn't want slavery to end. For economic reasons, they, uh, they, they were pretty supportive of slavery, and I think what's crucial about this turning point with, with Hinton Helper is Hinton Helper basically convinces a lot of the economic elites in the North that actually know. You might think that it's for your kind of economic advantage to continue slavery, but actually you could be making even more money and you could be doing even better, and we could be producing even more cotton without the slaves. So you don't need to uh, be, uh, 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 in order for, uh, you know, you can, you can still support kind of growing cotton in this kind of uh, economy, but you don't need to support uh, slavery. And in the book, I'm not going to do it here because I only have five minutes, I'll do it very briefly, but in the book I try to explain why it is in the 1850s, at this particular moment, uh, both in the North and the South, we have this demise of the moral statistics and the rise of these economic uh, indicators. I argue in the uh, <coughs> South it has to do, and this is a topic that a lot of historians have been studying in the last few years, and that's the capitalization of the American slave, or the financialization of the American slave. Slavery obviously, obviously exists in America uh, from the 17th century, but it, it, it's changing by this point. You know, uh, People uh, have written books about the insurance industry, the mortgage-backed derivatives that are based on slaves, the, the, the bank, uh, uh, stocks that people all over the world are buying based on basically uh, slave mortgages. It's becoming a financialized asset and there's a lot of studies that show that uh, slaves are beginning also to imagine, uh, sorry, slave owners are beginning to imagine their slaves as uh, assets. Uh, they're valuing them according to their future income flows. That's what the, the, the definition of what capitalization is, hivun in Hebrew, is just the notion that you're an income generating asset, you're going to make $100 a hundred dollars a year for me, so I've, through that, that's how I'm going to measure your actual value. I'm not going to just go into the market and say, who wants the slave? I'm not going to begin to imagine this as kind of like this income generating asset. And that's what in many ways begins, uh, and you can see there's a quick, uh, there's a clear line between this kind of imagining the slave as literally human capital and these arguments about their productivity and how much they produce and so forth. Uh, I argue that in the North, uh, similar kind of ideas, I call it investmentality, this idea of imagining uh, America, and, but, but also its citizens in the North as kind of these income generating investments. And I argue there the real uh, pushes the railroads. Uh, so you can hear, see here again, the 1850s is a huge decade uh, for American railroads. And very briefly, uh, I'm, I know you can't really read what this is saying, but this is a, basically a prospectus. This is someone, uh, some uh, entrepreneur who wants to build a railroad between Providence and Worcester created this chart. And basically, what I'm zooming in on what this chart says is basically the way they try to sell to investors that you should build this railroad between Providence and Worcester is by imagining, you know, not the, you know, they don't count prostitutes and they don't count libraries and they're not counting, you know, how many uh, people can read and write. They don't care about those numbers anymore. It's the statistics that these investors in the North in the Northeast, actually, are looking, and now as they look over America, is no more of these moral statistics. That's not the statistical vision that's interesting them. What's interesting them is, again, uh, these productivity figures, you know, how much uh, uh, money and how many goods can these people in these towns cr uh, create, because, of course, that's going to determine if the railroad is profitable or not by how many goods uh, and it can ship. Um, I'm just going to end, uh, so that's basically my argument, and I'll end by just saying that um, I think there is a link between this shift from moral statistics to economic indicators uh, in both the North and the South and, and the rise of, of the Civil War. So first I'll just say, I mentioned this before, but Hinton Helper's book was in, in incredibly important, uh, especially among ec getting economic elites on board. Uh, uh, very briefly, you know, most Americans in the North were not abolitionists. They did not believe that you know, slavery should be completely canceled or that all African Americans de deserved to become citizens. Most of them actually didn't believe that. Even Abraham Lincoln, before uh, he becomes president, has these very complicated theories about how he's going to compensate the slaveholders and then he's going to hopefully ship all the African, that African Americans back to Africa. Um, and so uh, this is an important moment politically when anti-slavery goes mainstream. It's no longer the fringe lefties uh, were kind of, this is now a mainstream movement that's saying that it's the economics, you know, it's not about 
uh, the well-being of African Americans. It's not a moral question, it's an economic question. And I would argue that I think in the last few years, uh, people have uh, kind of diminished the importance of these, this kind of economic and anti-slavery. Here I'm going to quote uh, Robert Fogel, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics for his, who quote, says, a new approach has transformed the anti-slavery from a minor political factor into a political force that could control the national agenda. And I think that might be true. And I'll just end by saying, um, I'm not sure what the message is for us today, as on one hand, I'm not particularly fond of imagining all of us only as human capital. On the other hand, I do think that maybe the reason slavery ended in America, and even maybe why uh, there were enough elites that supported Abraham Lincoln and he won the election, and that in the end slavery ended, is because they convinced enough people, by the way, Abraham Lincoln was very good at this, and had very complicated kind of calculations that he would make, that he basically kind of used these arguments, not always, he would also use often the moral kind of arguments, but oftentimes he did use these arguments to get people on board. Uh, so again, I'm not saying uh, we should begin to create economic indicators of uh, the occupation, the, of the occupation, but I think it's definitely, uh, again, I think it's a flip, that there, it's a question that I think we should ask. I'm not we sure, try, we I'm not sure I, I support it, but I definitely think. We tried it in the 80s. I, I, that's what I was saying. I think, I think the real politic in me might say that you could do it, but, but I'm not sure if the moral statistical side in me would want that. So thank you very much.